الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي ابتعثنا لنخرج العباد من عبادة العباد إلى عبادة رب العباد وصلى اللهم على نبينا المصطفى وعلى حبيبنا المجتبى وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم التناد أما بعد قد قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وسارعوا إلى مغفرة من ربكم وجنة عرضها السماوات والأرض وعدت للمتقين قال الله عز وجل في مكان آخر وسيق الذين كفروا إلى جهنم زمرا حتى إذا جاءوها فتحت أبوابها إلى آخر الآية قال عامر بن عبد قيس رحمه الله لو كشف الغطاء مزددت يقينا My dear respected brothers, friends and sisters there was a time within the Hijazi period there was a time within the Arab Peninsula where and we know these stories, we know these narrations where children would kill and murder their fathers to take their wealth, to take their kingdom to take their wives as their own we know that in time in the Arab, in the Arab times before Islam people would bury their daughters alive out of despite for them that why was I given a daughter? and we know the jahala and the ignorance that was prevalent at the time to such an extent historians have written in regards to the Byzantine Empire that was in control at the time that why didn't they ever take over the Hijazi area? They were, they were an empire. Why never conquer Mecca and Medina? And it's mentioned that they said that we don't conquer, we don't rule over barbarians. But my dear respected brothers, friends and sisters, everything changed. It was as if for us, overnight paradigm shifts, something that can't be attributed to this dunya, something from the unseen, and it was Quran. Everything changed to such an extent people wanted to live in Medina. People were dying and striving to live in Mecca. People traveled so far just to do tijara with the Muslims because they knew the Muslims wouldn't cheat them. They knew these people are truthful people. They knew that if they journeyed on this route, no one will steal their products. They would get the best inventory. So people were living in Mecca. People were living in Medina. People would go to Yemen, far, far lands, only because they knew that this journey, it was safe. No one was going to cause us any trouble. These people believe in Allah. They believe in the teachings of Rasulullah And the precedent was sent by the Quran. Could you imagine? The Arabs, the, the shu'ara, the poets, they weren't Muslim. But when Rasulullah came with Quran, they would fall into sajda. Just like that. The narration of Hassan bin Thabit radiallahu an, when he heard the Quran, he fell into sajda crying. 20, 30, 40, 50 years we spend our lives reciting Quran, Taraweeh. Many of our kids, our, our ulama become hafad. We hear the best of recitations. But nothing happens to us. There's no, this paradigmic sh change. Nothing, there's no shift. We keep going on with our lives. But look at what Allah Azza wa Jal does from His fadl. Not only does He change the lives of Sahaba through the Quran, He gives them incentives. There's subtle details of, of Jannah, subtle details of Jahannam. Could you imagine Al-Walid bin Waghira? It's a very famous narration. A person who isn't a Muslim. The Quraysh, they come to him and they say, Ya Walid, we see you as one of the most wise amongst us. Can you tell us how we can confine or come up with a plot to kind of falsify the divinity of the Quran? He said, come up with something. They said, Naz'um anna Muhammadan sallallahu alayhi wa we're going to claim that Muhammad, he's a, he's a shair, he's a poet. Al-Walid and Maghira says, La wallah, this is impossible. I swear by Allah, it's impossible. We know poets. We know, we know their rhymes, their tones, their rhetoric. We know everything about them. He's not a poet. So come up with something else. And mind you, Al-Walid and Maghira, he's the father of Khalid bin Walid, Khalid bin Walid and Al-Walid ibn Walid, who isn't a Muslim. He says, come up with something else. Give me another suggestion. They said, Ya Walid, we're going to say... He's a magician. He says, La Allah. He says, There's no way he's a magician. It's impossible. We know magicians, we know their tricks, their tactics. This person is a magician. They say, He's Nazrum Annahu Majnoon. He said, Fine. We're going to claim he's a little bit crazy. He says, No. La Allah. He's swearing on the name of Allah. Impossible. This person isn't a Majnoon. He's not crazy. And then at the end of the narration, he says such beautiful lines of the Quran that to this day they, res they transcend time. Lines that are coming from a kafir who isn't a Muslim, the mushrik. He says that the Quran is something that no one can ever come up with. No one can ever manifest. No one can ever articulate. 
It's something that's superior to everything. It's like rain. When rain drops, it's very soft. And how it touches the soil, the soil becomes very soft. He says, this is just the Quran. It's tender, it's lax. It resonates with every single believer. But from Allah Azza wa Jal's fadl, he didn't stop there. The magnificence of the Quran doesn't end there. He took it to another level for all the believers. He says, look, if you accept the Quran, there are aspects of Jannah within the Quran that go find them. Start swimming, dive into the Quran, look for those. And the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, obviously they did that. They spent their lives sitting with Rasulullah sallallahu learning the Quran from him. And there's so many examples of this. Very, very subtle example. I'm not talking about surahs. I'm not talking about verses. I'm not talking about words. I'm talking about letters that set the precedent for Jannah for every believer. Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran, He says, وَسِيقَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِلَى جَهَنَّمَ زُمَرًا حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءُوهَا فُتِحَتْ أَبْوَابُهَا Allah Azza wa Jal, He says in Surah Zumar, that when the, the, a time will come where the kuffar will be brought in front of Jannah, in Jahannam. They will be dragged to the gates of Jahannam. So what will happen? Futihat abwabuha. The gates of Jahannam will be made to open for these people. You see, the person is being dragged to the gates of Jahannam. The gates are closed. Now the person is standing at the ataba tulbab. He's standing at the footsteps of Jahannam. These gates are made open for this person. But look what Allah Azza wa Jal says in the second verse after this. وَسِيقَ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْ رَبَّهُمْ إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ زُمَرًا حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءُوهَا وَفُتِحَتْ أَبْوَابُهَا Literally, this one letter changes the entire dynamics of, of Jannah for every believer. It shows and manifests the rahmah of Allah. Remember, in the first, there was no وَفُتِحَتْ It was just فُتِحَتْ The person comes to Jahannam, the angels of the guardians of Jahannam, they open the gates for this person, and this person goes to hell. May Allah Azza wa protect and save us all from the fire of hell. Everyone say, Ameen. Now the second verse, what does Allah say? That these people, the people of Jannah, they will be brought in front of Jannah. They will be brought in front of the gates of Jannah. This time the doors of the gates of Jannah do not open. They don't open. Because they remain open. The doors of Jannah remain opened. This signifies the love of Allah Azza wa Jal for mankind. Showing us that this is something achievable. You can gain and garner Jannah. This is something, this is not something for the mustuhilat. The ayar man, only the ulama are going to go to Jannah. Or the pious people or the, those who are teaching at Darul Salaam, they're the only ones that are getting Jannah. No, Allah is setting the precedent. Jannah is for everyone. The doors of Jannah are open for every believer. We just need you to walk towards it. If you don't walk towards it completely, at least get near it. Allah Azza wa Jal will do the rest through His Rahmah. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal that He allows us to enter Jannatul Firdaus بِغَيْرِ hisab, and that we never see the fire of hell. But like I mentioned earlier, the Qur'an is filled with these subtle, subtle things about Jannah which allow the Sahaba to appreciate what Allah Azza wa Jal was, was saying, what His speech manifested because it gave us an idea how to conceptualize Jannah. Allah Azza wa Jal, and He says this in many places in the Qur'an, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَىٰ مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ وَعِدَّةٍ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ He says this in many different places in different variations. I'm from New York, okay? So many years ago, many, many years ago, we were proud to have had the highest or tallest skyscraper, Empire State Building. Then the people of Chicago got a little bit jealous and they made the Sears Tower. So Allah said, look, he doesn't like jealousy, he made Sears bankrupt. But that's for another discussion. <laughs> New York, you cannot compare Chicago to New York. Mashallah, New York is Allahu Alam. But anyway, I just had to throw that, make sure Chicago knows that New York, Mashallah. Anyway, long story short, when we explain the vastness of something, if I tell you, explain me how, mag how grand or how prowess or how magnificent or how massive the Burj Khalifa is, for example, you will tell me, brother, mashallah, you're, if you look at it for a couple of seconds, the back of your neck is going to start to hurt. And X, Y, Z, it's in the skies. And, and the first level, they break iftar at one level. The other level, they break iftar a little bit earlier. And the other level, because of the time, because it's massive. Allah Azza wa Jal never ever explains Jannah in the Quran from its length. We know 
that if you want to ex- explain the vastness of something, you explain it to the length. Empire State Building, Sears Tower, Burj Khalifa, and all the other random buildings in the world, it's length. No one cares about the vastness because the length is what shows how great and grandeur it is. Allah doesn't do this. When Allah Azza wa Jal explains the size and the vastness of Jannah in the Quran, Arduha. He explains it through its width. Now the question here is, why would Allah Azza wa Jal do this? Why would Allah Azza wa Jal explain Jannah from its width? The reason why He does it like this is because if we can, man- if we can ascertain that the Jannah is vast only to its width, just imagine its length. So Allah Azza wa Jal sets that precedent. So imagine, Amir ibn Abd Qaysin, rahimahullah, he has his one famous kind of author or narration. He's, he says himself, لَوْ كُشِفَ الْغِطَاءُ مَزْدَدْتُ يَقِينًا Because they had Quran. They had the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu They didn't even need people like me to come and explain Jannah to them. They had the Quran. They sat there. They did, they did tadabbur. They explored and they found such subtleties of Jannah that they knew this book, this kitab, Quran is only from Allah. Amir ibn Abdul Qaysin, he says, rahimahullah, if a person... He's a salaf, one from the pious predecessors. He says, He says, if someone brings Jannah in front of me, Wallahi, my yaqeen in Allah and Jannah will not increase. If someone brings Jahannam in front of me, and this current of Jannah and Jahannam is uplifted, and I see it physically, like in actual time in this reality, my iman and yaqeen won't change. Why? Because this person had Quran. He didn't need anyone to explain to him Jannah. He didn't need anyone to tell him about Jahannam. Because Allah set the precedent in the Quran. He was someone who did tadabbur. He is someone who gave his life for the deen of Allah. And he explored, explored, explored to such, such times where he comes to the realization, I don't need anything anymore. Bring Jannah in front of me. My iman is at a level that it's, it, it just won't increase. It won't fluctuate. Because this person had Quran. And we have, especially for the youth, we have to understand, we all want Jannah. Every believer strives for Jannah. We came to this retreat hoping that inshallah, I will please my Rabb by pleasing Allah, Allah will bless me with Jannah. But like how Mufti Izhar, may Allah Azza wa Jal preserve him, mentioned, time is always short. How much can we talk? I know all the buzz are sitting here aching, talking, waiting for, for us to talk about Hurul Ains and the sisters are going to get upset at us and... We're not going to go there. I'm going to take, I'm going to follow my teachers. So I'm not going to do it. But we all want to talk about these things. Time is short. Spend time on your own learning about the Quran. Spend time in the Quran. Spend time in the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Learn Jannah. Strive for Jannahs on your own. Learn what Allah has prepared for us. Allah Azza wa Jal. Question. And I want anyone to answer. How many, do, uh, if you're studying in Darul Salaam, caveat. If you're studying in Dar es Salaam in any madrasa, you're not allowed to answer. And all the ulama here are not allowed to answer anything, okay? There's a couple of questions. So no cheating. And if an alim is sitting next to you, do not whisper to him to give you the answer. How many gates does Jannah have? Eight or seven? Who said seven? It's eight. I gave, it was my own local masjid. I mean, it's my own local masjid. I've been... For, it's my masjid I've been there for 3-4 years I don't know how many times We spoke about Jannah and Jahannam I asked this question I'm like how many gates of Jannah have Wallahi all of them were so fixated That it's 7 I became in shock I said whoa whoa time out They're like Ravi, it's, it's, seven. it's 7 It's Quran Quran 7 I'm like okay hold on time out No it's, it's, it's Jannah has 8 Jahannam has 7 Okay Jannah has 8 gates Jahannam has 7 this is all very important. Because remember, our ultimate goal is, is Jannah. The Qur'an will take us there. We just have to do some exploring, some tadabbur, some discovery. Eight gates of Jannah, seven of hell. Which color is attributed in the Qur'an to Jannah? Which color in the Qur'an is attributed to Jannah? Okay. Who says white? Raise your hands. No ulama, no students of knowledge. No cheating. Who says white? Okay, who says green? It's green, mashallah. Mashallah, brother, he saved himself from the last test. He said, you're, you're 50% now. Yes, the color attributed to Jannah, green. Which color is attributed or associated with the fire of hell? What color is the fire of hell? Black. Oh, 
Everyone knows this one. Oh, because you guys heard it earlier. Okay, alhamdulillah. You guys are all cheating. Okay, no, we'll let that one pass. The fire of hell is black. So now remember this. Jannah has eight gates. The color associated and attributed to Jannah, green. Jahannam has seven gates. The color attributed and the color of the fire of hell, black. How many times do you think Allah Azza wa Jal says the word green in the Quran? Khudr. How many times do you think Allah says green in the Quran? Eight. How many times do you think Allah says the word black in the Quran? Seven. If you add eight gates of Jannah, seven gates of hell, if you add those two numbers together, what do you get? Fifteen. MashaAllah. Everyone's still awake. Good. I think because tomorrow's an off day, so everyone's minds are still fresh. Yes. Do you know how many times Allah Azza wa says abwab, says the word gates in the Quran? Fifteen. What makes this more spectacular is Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was ummi, he was illiterate. It was impossible for the message of Allah after, say the entire revelation of the Quran, he comes, he says, you know what? There's 14 abwab, if you add 8 and 7, it makes 15. Let me add an extra word, gates, here. It can't work like that. Because also some, he can't read, he can't write. He can't go back and fix things. This is what the Sahaba and the Ulama, our Salaf, really appreciated. He said, look, let's dive into the Quran and just see what pearls we can extract. I mean, Mufti Azhar mentioned this earlier, we can spend the rest of our lives exploring the Quran, but Jannah is a topic that no believer can ever deny. Almost every other page, Jannah, 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 almost every page, Allah Azza wa Jal is speaking about Jannah. Why? Because we need to go back where we came from. That is our ultimate goal. So Allah Azza wa Jal puts subtle hints, subtle secrets in the Quran that will kind of revive our hearts, revive our love and desire to return where, we came, where our father came from, Adam alayhi salam. And we'll keep going. I think I have some time, alhamdulillah. You know sometimes non-Muslims might tell us, I mean not sometimes, they do. They say that, okay brother, if in Jannah, if everything that we have in this life is better than what we have, if everything we have here, what will we, what we will have in Jannah is better. So if we have, for example, water here, the water in Jannah is better. We hear this all the time. Now, what if, <clears throat> what if they say it to you, fine. The food in Jannah is better than the food in this dunya. But what about the gatherings? In this paradigm, this reality that we are all co-signed to, we have two types of gatherings, right? For example, if you, if you go to a da or you go to some, your family member's house, you know, our family members, they don't really care about us too much. So when we go to their house, they put the food on the table and they say, go serve yourselves. Open buffet. They say, look, you know, mashallah, I see you every other day. Just pick up your plate like a good Muslim. Go get your biryani, your, your, your whatever you like, and take your food and sit down. Open buffet. Now if you go to a very posh event, you go to a wedding, you go to um, some da'wah, mashallah, brothers are getting taken care of, sisters are getting taken care of, you get served. A person comes to you, uh, the waiter comes, you know, he's wearing his outfit, his suit, and he comes and he serves you food. So now we have two types of gatherings. We have... One where you have an open buffet, you take your own food, mashallah, you, you fill it to the top and you eat like half of it. The other half, Allah alam, where it goes, may Allah forgive all of us. I remember once I was out a nikah in the masjid. And this is my first time going to the nikah in the masjid with my hips teacher, Hafiz uh, Shakil Habibullah. So we were at the nikah and I didn't know he was going to sit next to me. I just like, so I go, this is when I was young. I go, I, I grab a plate, and it's already like kind of in our minds, it's intrinsic at some point, that when you go and it's an open buffet, take as much as you can, because they all might finish. So I go, we take food, you know, I just kept piling, 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 I went and sat down, and I'm a decently skinny guy, after a few, probably eating a little bit, I got full. And lo and behold, my teacher was sitting right in front of me, he barely even ate his own food, the whole time he's looking at me like this. <laughs> I was like, Ustazi, I'm sorry, I, it was a mistake. He's like, but you got to eat all of this. I, was like, I kept going and going. At, you know, I had talk, talks here and there, tried to pass the time so my teacher could get up and leave. And he, he wouldn't, but he said, but yeah, I'm not leaving anywhere. You have to finish, clean it. I said, I said I, if I continue, this is how I'm going to die. I was like, I'm going to kill myself. So we have two types of events. We have one, we have the open buffet, where Allah Azza, where we go, it's, you take our own food. And then the second type we have, is where someone serves us. So the question is right, arisen. Okay, fine. 
If Jannah is better than everything, if everything in this dunya cannot compare to the blessings and bounties of Jannah, then what about this? Is there anything better in Jannah? You have the open buffet. Okay, you might have, and Allah Azza wa Jal speaks about the open buffet. He says the righteous that will enter Jannah, they will get drinks, they will pour their own drinks, so it's self-service. You get your own drinks, you feed yourself, mashallah, to your full, half full, whatever. So the open buffet concept is spoken about in the Quran. Now the question is, what about being served? Yes, being served is also mentioned. Same surah, suhadar. That these people, they will be served from these kind of fixtures and they will be given wine, they will be given food. So both are spoken about. Those righteous that enter Jannah, they will get their own food. Those who are a little bit more superior in virtue, they will be fed. They will be given food. So both the open buffet and also being served is spoken about in Jannah. Is anything better? What could be better? The non Muslim might tell us, okay, where's your proof for something being better? Allah Azza wa Jal leaves nothing to chance. Allah Azza wa Jal says, yes, there's something better. وَسَقَاهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ شَرَابًا طَهُورًا There's the open buffet. There's the, the service, full service. That Allah Azza wa Jal, He takes it another step further. He says, yes, we have open buffet. Yes, we will serve you. But the ultimate host is Allah. وَسَقَاهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ شَرَابًا طَهُورًا That the people of Jannah will be given food, they will be given drinks by Allah. Allah will feed these people. Allah will take these care of these people. Allah will be the ultimate host. What better than Allah Azza wa Jal hosting us? Imagine we're in Jannah and Allah Azza wa Jal is bringing us food. Allah Azza wa Jal is bringing us something to drink. Obviously none of us deserve it. But Allah does it because He says we were obedient to Him. We worshipped Him. We, were, we, we submitted to His commandments. My dearest but the brothers, friends and sisters, it all starts here. We all want to go to Jannah. We want to be saved from the fire of hell. We want to talk about the hur. So we, want to, we want to enjoy. We want to just lavish with no stress, no property tax, no crazy you know, housing market. We want to gain Jannah, but you need to take that step. You know, someone showed me a very funny video, and this actually, it actually happened after uh, one of the sheikhs, he gave a talk about Jannah. Uh, one of the sisters came up, and mashallah, was so, a very excitement. She comes, she said, mashallah, sheikh, very nice talk. You spoke about um, mothers and fathers going to Jannah. You spoke about the scholars and the hufad entering Jannah. You spoke about the righteous children and children entering Jannah. You spoke about those who established masajid, those who established institutions, those who fast for the sake of Allah, those who give charity for the sake of Allah. Mashallah, it's all amazing. And then she started to cry. She said, Shaykh, what about my cat? <laughs> is, she, is she going to go with me? The Shaykh started, I mean, she was crying. Everyone started to laugh. And the Shaykh tells her that, look, if you go to Jannah, Allah will give it to you. But our number one objective, we, start, we need to start walking towards it. We're so stagnant. We're stuck in quicksand. Just a few weeks ago, I was giving a youth halaqa, my own masjid. We have kids, mashallah, they're, they're intellectuals. I don't know, 13, 12-year-old kids. They ask questions about everything. We're speaking about Jannah, speaking about Jannah, speaking about Jannah. And he says, Brother Rafiq, I have a question. I said, ah, oh, here it goes. They said, can, can I just, easy question. And I said, what? What is it? He says, you know, I had to answer his question too. His brother was on the management, and his father's on the management. I was like, I have to be nice to this child. He says, Brother Rafiq, I have one question. I says, what? He says, can you prove to me Jannah exists? Can you prove to me Jannah exists? I said, 100%. He says, how? I said, just read the Quran. There is no way that any human being could have ever come up with the Quran. There are, we speak about the contradictions we speak about the miraculous nature of the quran we speak about the beauty of the quran wallahi al-azim there is such things in the quran that just go for example allah azza wa jal in surah nisa he says whenever allah azza wa jal speaks about ahlul jannah he says khalidina fiha abada when he speaks about ahlul nar not kufar ahlul nar he says khalidan fiha you see the difference Whenever Allah speaks about Ahlul Jannah, the people of paradise, He says, Khalidina fiha abada. That these people, all of them, plural, all of them will be in Jannah forever. Khalidina, it's a plural, it's jama'ah. 
all of them will be in paradise together. When he says, when he speaks about Ahlul Nar, not the Kufar, Ahlul Nar, the people of the fire, he says, Khalidan fiha, that these people will be in the fire of hell forever. Khalidan is singular, it's not plural. So, for example, if I say we are all going, I need the adjective in the Arabic language has to match the ism, the noun. So it also needs plural, plural. And same thing for Ahlul Nar, the people of Jahannam. If there are many people going to Jahannam, then all of them have to be in the fire of hell. Khalidan. Allah Azza wa Jal Quran is literally so perfect. The most minute detail isn't missed. Look what Allah says. Why does He do this? Khalidina fiha abada. This is a gift to all of us. One of one facet of punishment, COVID-19. One of the issues we had with COVID-19 being stuck in the house. Praying Jummah on our own. Praying Salah on our own. Eat Salah on our own. We can't meet our friends. We can't socialize. We can't have a good time. We can't go picnic. We can't go to retreats. We can't go on Jummah. We can't do anything. We're confined to the boundaries of our home. That is a facet of punishment. It's adab. People started to go crazy. Obviously then social media kind of helps. But still people want to leave their house. They want to socialize. They want to go out. They want to go to a restaurant. They want to come to the masjid. And Allah Azza wa Jal knew this. So He says those that enter paradise, they will be there forever. Never do they have to worry about leaving. So if I enter and there's a chance that my friend who's with me, he might leave, that's a facet of punishment. I want to enjoy Jannah with my father. I want to enjoy Jannah with my mother, with my siblings, with my wife, with my kids, with my family members. So if they enter with me, Allah says, just know, I guarantee you, they'll never leave you. They will be you for, with you forever. So don't have this worry. They will be with you forever and ever. There's no time limit. So look what he says for, for the fire of hell. When he speaks about Ahlul Nar, he speaks, he says, they will be in the fire of hell, Khalidan, singular. Why did he make it singular? If the people of hell are going to hell, they should be there forever. But Allah used singular here, Khalidan, because we know that some people, when they go to the fire of hell, they will be taken out. So they won't be there forever. They, their time there might be temporary. They will atone for their sins and Allah will bless them with Jannah. And Allah knew this. Allah knew that these people that enter the fire of hell, they won't be there forever. So the adjective has to match the theory that those who don't, that enter Jannah, they will be atoned for their sins for a very short time. Up until their good deeds outweigh their bad deeds, then they'll go to Jannah. My dear respected brothers, friends and sisters, there's just so many things in the Quran, so many things in the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Wallahi al-Azim, no human can, can say that there's, some, there's a mistake here, there's a contradiction. It's just beyond the scope of imagination. No human can manifest or even articulate something even my own similar to this. I said I won't speak about Hur Al-Ain, but I'll make the sisters a little bit happy today. It won't make them that happy, but at least inshallah it'll, it'll do the trick. Hur Al-Ain. Whenever Allah Azza wa Jal speaks about the Rijal, the Mu'minun, whenever Allah Azza wa Jal speaks about the Azwaj, meaning whenever Allah speaks about the men and women, meaning husbands and wives, when he speaks about them entering Jannah, he never mentions Hurul Ain. When he speaks about the husband and the wife and the children, Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't mention Hurul Ain. He only mentions Hurul Ain in Quran whenever he's only speaking about the men. As if giving the men what we want and kind of giving the sisters what they want. As if he's protecting the emotions of the sisters. He knows that the sisters have this in their hearts that they feel some type of way sometimes, actually all the time, that if Hur al-Ain is brought up or a second wife, third wife is brought they, uh, it's not, it's intrinsic nature. They're supposed to feel something. Fatima radiallahu anha felt something. So it's normal. But Allah Azza wa is even protecting them at that time. That read the Quran and I promise you your emotions will be inshallah secure. The Quran will never put us at a level where, yeah, why, did, why is this? What? It doesn't happen. So my dearest brothers, brothers, friends and sisters, if we want Jannah, find it in Quran. For, regardless of this retreat, Mufti Izhar mentioned it earlier, I mean, I, I'm a millennial, right? So I'm young. So we're considered lazy, right? This is like, we're considered entitled lazy. Just give it to us very short, sweet, five, six seconds videos and move on. So... When I was in my fourth year of Islamic studies, this question used to come in my mind. How is the Qur'an beautiful? How, how was it possible that Hassan bin Thabit, he would hear the Qur'an and fall into sajda? That 
Amir ibn Abd Qaysin, he would say something like this, لو كشف الغطاء مزددت يقينا How is all of this possible? So I went on this journey. I said, look, if I'm having this issue of kind of understanding the Quran, maybe someone else might have it. So for six and a half years, almost seven years, we kept spending researching, had other scholars help. We eventually came up, we, it was supposed to be just own mutala, just for myself, that would benefit me and my family. Eventually, just Sheikh Awama, Habibullah, he used to always say, uh, one time I, was, I used to study with him, and he said to me, we were, we were going up in the elevator, and he asked me, he said, where are you from? Pakistan, India, Bangladesh. I said, uh, uh, Sheikh, I'm from Afghanistan. And he says to me, can you tell me one scholar from Afghanistan? I just put my head down. I'm like, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. He says, do you know anyone from Afghanistan or any of the ulama? I said, I don't know. And then we went into his room. He says, if the ulama don't continue to push ilm, if they don't continue to write about the, the salaf, if they don't write about the ulama, if they don't write, write, eventually deen might start fading. So just write. And he gave me so many stories right off the top of his head about ulama of Afghanistan, which, I mean, obviously every country has their uh, most... MashaAllah, they gave me extra time. <laughs> I must be special. I never ever has this ever happened. They gave me more time. Usually it's always too much. No, MashaAllah, may Allah bless. I think, I think he came a little bit late. It's okay, no problem. We'll, we'll, we'll end on time. But he used to always say this, just right, right. So eventually we wrote a book that it's, it's for lazy people. It's about the Quran. It's aspects about the Quran that it will, it will give a believer such love for the Quran that this person will never be idhnillah if he reads it sincerely. He'll never have doubt about the Quran. And inshallah, it will lead him to Jannah. I mean, so many secrets just in the book about Jannah. I just can't even start. I mean, we'll be here forever. And I know we have, mashallah, we have the Quran recitation happening as well. So we have books outside, secrets of the Quran. It took six and a half years to write. We had so many ulama, we had sheikhs, even Sheikh Saad Qadri from Chicago help with it. Uh, many scholars help with it. If any of the brothers, they want to understand the Quran from a different paradigm, a perspective that bi'idhnillah will not only give them mahabba for the Quran, but also non-Muslims. And it will increase their desire to attain Jannah, to fight for Jannah, for just, just to desire Jannah. Sometimes just coming to a retreat might not do it. Giving sadaqah, reciting Quran, so nonetheless, inshallah, I'll end with this, regardless of this retreat, regardless of the book secrets of the Qur'an, regardless of Ramadan, regardless of everything, every believer needs to have some sort of ta'alluq with the Qur'an. Everyone. If the Sahaba gain Qur'an, if everything changed for them through Qur'an, but then what about us? Many of us have financial difficulties. Many of us might have health issues. If a person has Qur'an in his life, Allah will make everything easy for him. Allah will protect him from things he can never imagine. Allah will make everything easy for him to such an extent, he will be amongst those, وَسِيقَ الَّذِي رَبَّهُمْ إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ He will be the person Allah is speaking about when he is brought in front of the gates of Jannah, the gates of Jannah will be open for this person. We ask Allah Azza wa that he makes us from the people of Quran. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal, he makes us from the people of Jannah. We ask Allah that he forgives us for all of our sins and shortcomings. We're believers, we have mistakes. We, we, we have shortcomings. But if we can truly sit in front of Allah and make this dua that, Ya Allah, I am trying. Ya Allah, I am trying. If a person from the depths of his heart can say this, Allah bi will bless this person with Jannah. But we need to take the footsteps. We need to start walking the walk. Talk is very cheap. Sitting here, coming to the retreat, mashallah, all the free food, all the nice basketball tournament, all the, the bubble teas that I see everyone drinking. It's all nice. It's beautiful. But our goal is Jannah. We want to be that person that's invited to Allah Azza wa Jal's da'wah. We want to be that person that Allah Azza wa Jal is serving us. And imagine, can we even fathom Allah Azza wa Jal serving us? So we need to take our, these necessary footsteps. Do it wherever way you can. Maybe purchase the book Secrets of the Quran, hopefully that gets you closer to Allah. Enroll yourself in an intensive at Darul Salaam. Become an alim. Maybe get your kids involved in the masjid. Make them hufad. Do something to win your Jannah. Now, and this Ma Zakari, rahimahullah, he used to say that every family should have at least one hafid in their life, in their family. Every family should have at least one child who is a hafid then maybe because of this person, Allah Azza wa Jal blesses the entire family with Jannah. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal for tawfiq. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal that He blesses all of us, our families, our sisters, our forefathers, our mothers, fathers who have passed away, that He blesses all of us with Jannah. And we ask, and I humbly request that all the brothers make dua for our youth. 
They're the next generation. A day will come, we will all be gone. Maybe 20, 30, 40 years, we will all be gone. They will be the ones talking about Jannah. They will be the ones talking about Jahannam. We ask Allah that He preserve, preserves their Iman. We ask Allah that he, that he makes them the stars of guidance for every single believer, for every single non-Muslim. That when a non one of the students was asking me, how can we do this, how can we do that for non-Muslims, as in da'wah purposes. In essence, a believer is supposed to illuminate the sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu When non-Muslims see us, they say, wow, that's a Muslim? Subhanallah. That only happens if we inculcate Quran in our lives and the sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu We ask Allah Azza wa Jal for tawfiq. Subhanallah rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Alhamdulillah.